Welcome back to the Empowered Woman, Badass, and Unfiltered Podcast. Today, we are talking about why women must keep this one thing in their back pocket. And that is knowing when to walk away from their job and quiet, like conscious quitting and great resignation has really changed the marketplace um, and really allowed women to up level. Today, I've got Sarah McElroy here and we... I'm so excited to get into this. Um, Her links are linked below. She is the owner of Raise to Rise. This is going to be a good one. I'm so excited. Sarah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Olivia. It's great to be here. So tell me a little bit about your personal story. Like, you know, you were, you were a part of this hustle culture. Uh, And I'm, 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 I was in the beginning, I was like that too. So yeah, share, share your story. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's alluring, right? I really, for me, I was always that good girl. I was the good girl growing up. I performed academically. I graduated valedictorian and it was just like, I remember graduating and thinking like I had the world figured out. It was like, the the society at large life gave you kind of this playbook of how to achieve success and happiness and as long as you did all the things and you checked all the boxes and executed it according to the proper plan you would be promised happiness or at least that's what the naive 18 year old version of sarah thought but you know the idea of like find that one linear career path stay generally in that swim lane climb the ladder pull down the the bigger paychecks the chase the fancier titles that all felt like something i could do and be good at so it's what i did and eventually though it ca- it caught up with me i was 35 in 2020 I got my first c level job i'm super proud it's like everything i thought i wanted on paper and i'm juggling an executive mba program at the same time and between the two of them trying to prove myself at work and be able to hold on and and get good grades through graduation, I started working up to 20 hours a day, not every single day, but really unsustainable. And it was one of those things where it's like, I could feel my legs moving and the whole scenario wasn't, wasn't feeling good as far as like, this is sustainable, or this is a way to live because I really was this one trick pony. I was like school work, produce machine, that was it all the time. I had really no personal life or uh, honestly human <laughs> humanness to me. And my body started to rebel during that time. I had a couple of episodes of throwing up blood that landed me in the ER. And then finally in April, 2021, I got shingles. And that was really the wake up call moment for me. Like we're going to have to do something different because I can remember sitting in the little medical clinic and the doctor confirms what I thought that it, that it was shingles. I had this rash that was wrapping around my torso and it had been quite painful for about a week prior. And I remember when he told me I had shingles, I felt this deep sense of relief. And I was, I was overjoyed too, because I was getting 10 days off from work from the shingles diagnosis. Like I needed, he was saying like, you can't work right now. You need to recover. And I just didn't know how to ask for that kind of break myself. Then I didn't want to have to raise my hand and say, this was too much. And I'm struggling, especially at the the C-level job. I didn't want them to see my weakness. I was the youngest member of the executive team and treated like a kid sister at best, oftentimes even worse. And it was just like, well, now I'm going to get a break and it doesn't have to be me, Sarah, saying, I can't do this. I'm waving the white flag. It's like the doctor says you can't work. And so as I'm leaving the doctor's office, it's, you know, feeling that relief. I I also have this moment of awakening of like, okay, this isn't going to work anymore. This isn't living, Sarah. And so I actually quit on my last day out from shingles. And that was my first great resignation, but I've had two of them. So it's been an adventure, but that was part one. <laughs> okay. Tell me, I'm going to, I'm going to double back on some of the things you said, but tell me about the second one. Okay. Well, part two. So after, after leaving that job and deciding like, okay, full life reset, I get a new job down in Florida 
and I make the move down here. I decide I'm going to focus on prioritizing my health and well-being and, and just everyday joy. So I get this little house on the water. I'm going to the beach. I'm meditating. I'm doing yoga. I've also cut back on my working hours to a normal schedule. I have better boundaries around work than ever before. And I'm still not completely healing from the burnout. Now, this was during the time that my story was picked up by the Wall Street Journal, and I did both an interview for an article and a podcast for them. And you'll listen at the end of the podcast. It does end in sort of this picturesque way of like, Sarah found more peace on the water. And I became kind of the poster girl for pandemic burnout recovery. But I just, I didn't realize, and I couldn't put it together that I was walking into this toxic culture every day. I was dealing with some sexually harassing comments that weren't addressed for months. And it didn't dawn on me that a nascently healing burnout wound, that was like a paper cut on that wound. And walking into that organization and wondering what was going to happen every day. And I had just thought that burnout was really about overworking, the hours you're working and like all of that. And it's not, it's so much more of that chronic stress buildup. It's also indicative of silencing of our voices and suppressing our needs and staying somewhere too long that's no longer good for us. And so after they did do a very cursory check the box investigation months later, even uh, even though HR had heard one of the comments in October, it didn't happen till almost end of January. I got back the readout and it was just like four minutes of when she put an hour on my calendar, the HR woman put an hour on my calendar to tell me the outcomes. And it was four minutes and it was clearly, at least I believe it was just like bullet points that have been approved by HR, a lot of HR boilerplate related to, you know, we have an open door policy, we have a respectful uh, work environment. And, you know, Sarah, I know you know this, but you need to keep it confidential. Like that was like a good half <laughs> of what I got out of it. And there was no new accountability for the person. So I was just like, I, I know I cannot walk back into that organization tomorrow unless it is to turn in my laptop and be done. And that's what I did. I drafted this scathing anti-harassment resignation letter that night. And the next morning I took my laptop into the office before dawn and I hit send on the letter to both or to HR, uh, my boss and the CEO. And I walked out the door. I didn't give two weeks notice, no nothing. But it's like that good girl version of me that I had always been, who always followed the rules, who didn't use her voice, who, you know, executed on that good girl playbook to a T. She was broke open a bit after that shingles diagnosis. But with this happening at the job after I'm speaking up and I'm trying to be heard and it's clearly show, they're clearly showing I'm not being valued in the way that I would want to be an organization, it just like shattered me open and the good girl Sarah was gone. Like I just, I had to leave. And that's what inspired me actually to talk to other women because it was like, I cannot be the only woman right now in the midst of the great resignation who's getting mired in these spin cycles of burnout and getting, you know, going from one talk to the culture to another. And so that's what inspired the work of Race to Rise. Okay, I'm I'm doubling back really quick because um, there was a lot there that I kind of want to like dig on in on because I know that so many people um, battle with start, like some of these almost personality arch archetypes. The high achieving woman, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. We, yes. We are like silently suffering because we have like we have this pride attached to our ego because it's oh, like yes. we know it all I mean and I was I was so simple like I got life oh yeah this is but but <laughs> you know because you know that's how school was it's like you do this you do this we were taught a system and yes. you, you get good grades you just do this you you and you know what I think about 80 percent of life you can you know if you choose you know if you're mindful of your actions. You respond. You're you're mindful of how you respond to things and all that. But you don't account for natural disasters, body failures, you know, things like that. And 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 we weren't taught enough. I feel like at least I wasn't as a child that your body will tell you 
yes. when something is out of alignment for you. And I think that's really what happened in the first and second resignation for you. Your body still was telling you, hey, this is not right. Um, and I think that'll, that'll, we'll have to be forced to stop because we won't do it ourselves. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it was very much, it was almost too, it was like, Sarah, you didn't quite learn the the lesson fully the first time either, because it was, you know, I, I left that first organization. I didn't even express my uh, dissatisfaction around the culture and the way I was treated and things like that. I left so graciously with the two weeks notice. And then I come down into this, this other organization too. And it's like, I could feel it in my, I was, my well being was deteriorating physically, mentally, emotionally. Like I was, you know, had hair falling out. In addition to, I was diagnosed with situational anxiety when this got really bad, like went to a doctor and was diagnosed. And it's like our bodies have, my body had been telling me for, months, if not years, honestly, that I was not living the way that I should have. And it's not possible to live as these, like, you know, these machines that just execute and produce all of the, all of the hours of the day. And I agree that Olivia, like that has been probably my biggest learning out of all of this is that my body holds the key to uh, I think everything, right? All of the awareness that's needed for what to do next, like that, that inner wisdom and intuition, but also just bodies, our bodies know that they're brilliant in telling us what's right for us and what's not. Oh yeah. Um, and you mentioned chronic stress. And I mean, for me, when I get chronic stress, it tends to be my thinking patterns that start to really cause me to like downward spiral. Um, along with like work because <laughs> like, I will just do the most I will but um it's like I enjoy what I do so I, just, I don't find the issue in it right um but it's my my thinking patterns were you what were some of the things that you were thinking you know before right before the shingles happened are you know that when with everything going on with your 20 hour work days oh Great question. I have not been asked that question yet. When I think back, so it's kind of a mix of things. It was almost like that good girl break was going to happen sometime in the next couple of years because there was the part of me that was really operating very unconsciously. I mean, to the point when I was asked by Kate Leinbaugh, who's the um, the host of the podcast, uh, the journal podcast, and she asked me like, Sarah, why didn't you just stop after that first job when I got shingles and I quit, but then I jumped to another job. She was just like, why didn't you just stop and take time off? And it had never dawned on me. I just heard like crickets in my brain. Like, I don't even know how to answer this. <laughs> Kate line, but I don't know. I've never considered it. But so there was, there was just a lot, a large part of me during that time was just like, you just have to do what you have to do. And you almost get in this like, almost um like trance of sorts you know what I mean yes. like it's a weird unconscious automatic and and especially too because what I've learned too is that a lot of what was driving this was really shame and self-worth based and when that is coming from that unconscious place and that is what dr is driving a behavior you can you get caught in those behavior loops that are very automatic and um being driven by a place that is much more powerful than just your conscious awareness. So that was part of it. Cause, and I could even, I was even starting to observe that this was a thing that I was still going and I would feel uncomfortable even to rest. I felt like I almost had to always be doing something. So that was part of it. But then at the same time too, on the other side of it, I'm watching as things are unfolding in this toxic work environment. And I'm seeing the behavior of these people day in, day out. And it's, you know, you know, when like, you're in a situation and somebody shows you a behavior that you're not really thrilled about. And you're like, that kind of shows some questionable values. I don't think I'm being respected maybe completely the way that I should. I'm wondering if this is just a mark of a bad day for you, or if this is a true behavioral or characteristic of you. And I had long passed over the course of even just a few months, long past knowing or being able to question whether or not this was just like a bad day for these people. Like it was very clear that th this was how these people operated. And part of me knew 
along the way that I was going to have to leave and it wasn't going to work out, but I would second guess myself all the time. It was just like swinging on a pendulum back and forth between the auto automatic Sarah, good girl, go, 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 go. And you need, you need to keep this job because you've worked your whole life for it. And this other part of me that is starting to get confused and is like, this isn't normal. This isn't okay. But she was always overruled until shingles happened. What, um, what were some of the behaviors of people? And I, I do want to also know, like, what, did you notice any excess alcohol or drug abuse in your organizations? Um, I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you that. I couldn't tell you that. It's, um, it's an interesting question though. I just know that with the environment that we were in, it was a, a private equity backed company and there was a lot of pressure to mm -hmm. increase the value of the company. So in many ways, I will say I am a far better professional. My business acumen, my financial acumen are all much stronger for from working in that environment because it was like every day you're walking in and you're held accountable for every single number that you're delivering. So good lesson for me in that regard, because I've tended to always gravitate more toward the, uh, the creative side of marketing, which is what I was in. I was in a chief marketing officer role. So it was good to learn that in that regard. But on the other side of that, it was like this intense need for money to be all things all the time. And it was like money and performance and it, how we were creating this environment that it felt like it was the most important thing, even though they talked about culture and stuff like that, it was so damaging to be in that every day. And it's never enough. Nothing is ever enough. It's never going to be good enough. It was really tough. The continual improvement, the continual striving because it's never good enough. And that does attach to that self-worth. Yes. It, so much. So, Very wow. Much so Well, and I didn't realize that that is one of my deepest wounds from growing up is the never enough wound so you know like that was that girl that was trying to perform academically and she just continued and she ended up in an environment not shockingly right universe like <laughs> not shocking that I would end up in an, an environment where that environment saw like smell that weakness in me and was going to suck every ounce of life force out of my being because it could see that it was never enough and I was never going to say no it was never enough, but Sarah's just going to give until she's got nothing left. And so it was very much one of those experiences of like, this is what it's going to take to get you to stop finally, Sarah, to wake up. It was going to have to be really extreme. I believe that the word enough is one of the most powerful words in the English language. And this is why. And I, I didn't think about this before, like a year and a half ago. But I was speaking to a self-made multimillionaire that has a coffee franchise in South, Am at South Africa. She has now opened, I think, 35 stores. Wow. And she's, yeah, like franchised. And I mean, she's been doing this for like a total of 15 years. She, so it's like, it's crazy. She just turned 40. Like she is one of, yeah. you know, one of those people. Yeah. I mean, her husband definitely helps her out a lot. She's got her kids and she talks about balance, but she had to figure out what enough was like for her, what was enough money. But it's like, I feel like everybody has an enough question that they need to figure out. Um, And then I, I, I realized I just, for, I turned 30 and this is my, year that I'm focusing on contentment because it's back to that enough thing and we that is something we just don't define um you know because yeah you can have enough food but what is doing enough for me it's definitely like I'm one of those people because I, I can't is it enough work I don't know you know because that pride and shame yeah. and guilt will come into it you know what I'm saying so Completely. that's that never enough thing that you said that that really is what sparked that for me um what now millions of women have left 
their jobs in 2020. Why do you think it's mostly women? And well, we know the last two and a half, I guess, going on three years have been immensely difficult on everyone, but especially for women. It's been this intense pressure cooker. And so what we saw is that McKinsey and Lean In did their annual women in the workforce report. They released it 2020, 2021, and 2022. And we've almost been seeing the impact of what's happened during the pandemic as the, the numbers come out each year and are confirming what we, we thought had happened, which is that women not only were juggling professional responsibilities already and the bulk of the responsibilities at home, but it ratcheted up during the pandemic as safety nets evaporated. So we're talking the move to virtual schooling, childcare facilities closing, or perhaps we're not able to see our uh, our family and friends who may have been able to help with things like child care. It could be elder care too. But like all of a sudden, the well-oiled machine that was our system ground to the screeching halt and we realized that maybe we weren't really supporting women as much as they needed to be. In 2020, that report found that women were spending on average an additional three hours per day in really unpaid, unrecognized labor at home to keep the household running, and that they were three times as likely as their male counterparts in the household to be picking up that extra work. And so it, it's no wonder that you fast forward through more of the reports and women are facing burnout at a higher rate than men, somewhere between, it depends on the study, but 40 to 50% of women are reporting burnout or poor, very poor mental health. Uh, there was a, a Deloitte survey that came out back in April that more than 50% of women intend to quit their jobs in the next two years alone. And on a five-year horizon, that number skyrockets to 90%. 90% of women don't intend to be with their current employer in five years, which is just like mind boggling. And then you fast forward, okay, so the, the Women in the Workplace report comes out back in October of 2022 and found that women in leadership are walking out at the highest rate they've ever recorded. And to put it at scale, it's for every woman being promoted into director level ranks or above, there are two that are walking out the door. So it's just like, it's very clear, like maybe there was a point in time where we could sort of question whether or not the system was failing women earlier on in this, but what we see now is like very much so that is the case. Then it's compounded by all of the problems pre-pandemic that have not been solved related to harassment, uh, gender inequities in the workforce, pay dis you know, pay discrimination, like all of those things are coming into play and are really coming home to roost right now. You know, that 90% of women that don't plan on being at their jobs for five years, like in mind blowing. Years, like that and you know what I'm not even gonna pretend like that's not I I, I can absolutely believe that because yeah. I mean in five years it's like when you know how hard you have to work and you see you know the elevation I think a lot of women I mean what are a lot of these women doing in addition to their jobs and taking care of their households yeah. Are you, are you asking about the women who quit and what, what they're doing? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, so with, um, with my, my data set, that is the women that I've interviewed for this project. And, um, so mine can be a little bit different maybe from other more macro, but of the over a hundred women that I've spoken with, I really actually see a split of women who are changing jobs within a corporate within the corporate landscape and are moving from one organization to another. They're looking though for better cultures. Actually the uh, there's an awesome quote from the, uh, that women in the workplace report that came out uh, in October and the lean in CEO was like, let's be clear. It's not that women don't want to work. They're breaking up with bad employers and bad bosses. So it really is like people are wanting to move or moving between different corporate mu musical chairs to find better fits. Then you do have women who are pursuing entrepreneurship. And so it's actually been a pretty even split of the women that I've interviewed. I have yet to, uh, and it, you know, I've been finding mostly my, my women on LinkedIn. So it's a little bit different, but I personally have not interviewed a woman who has just exited the workforce entirely. Even the women who were 
choosing to spend more time at home with kids, they were still doing some type of work because it really mattered to them, which I think is so important to, to bring to bear here too, because you hear a lot of that refrain, like people will toss around in a very sensationalistic way. No one wants to work these days. Nobody wants to work anymore. And I don't believe that is the case. It's really that people are starting to say, I have a choice. I am going to prioritize my whole well-being and my family's well-being, my personal life over my career because it was just expected before. And now I have more of an option to be able to say that's not what I'm going to do. And I am going to actually care about my values, my desired work style and lifestyle, the type of work I want to do, schedule, all of those things, those matter to me. And I am going to make an effort to find organizations, jobs, et cetera, that, that work for me in that regard. And if I can't, then I'll start my own. I, I definitely um, see that. Tell me a little bit more about Raise to Rise. Yes. Well, so Raise to Rise has been capturing women's voices and stories from the Great Resignation, or at least that's what it, it started out to be. So within that 100 plus women that I've now interviewed and had conversations with, it's partially Great Resignation, but it's also women who made big career leaps prior, who now have the benefit of looking back on their their move and where it's taken them. So they've got the, the benefit of hindsight. And then I've also interviewed women who want to quit who feel stuck or trapped for one reason or another. And this is even beyond those who have a, a true financial hardship that would keep them somewhere. These are women who are really butting up against fear and, and other uh, limiting factors. So it's been really fascinating to get this full 360 degree look at what is happening and starting to see like, this is, this is very much indicative of a movement and a sea change of women starting to say, I'm going to right size the role of work in my life and I'm going to make work work for me again. So it's been so powerful to capture these stories. Some of them are shared on the website. It's actually becoming a book. The goal was really to say, how do we crowdsource this wisdom and insight from all of these amazing women and put it into a, a roadmap and a toolkit that can help other women do the same. Walk away from the job now if if you're needing to do that, but then also architect your career with greater intentionality moving forward. So you're not doing things like Sarah going from one toxic situation to another. Sometimes it can't be helped, but when we become consciously aware of our patterns, we can start to see how we could end up in similar repeating patterns down the line. That intentionality is so important when, you know, just creating the life. And I, I'm constantly talking to some of my, you know, employees, like I did this yesterday. I was like, um, so don't you have goals like this year? Like, aren't you supposed to be doing something else? You know? Okay. So when are you going to start doing that? Like I legit asked this girl yesterday because I didn't say it like that. I was like, you know, I was thinking about you, you know, I was thinking about some of the goals that you had. I'm just like, when are you going to start working towards that? You know? <laughs> and, and just putting your you have to know where you're going right you have yes. to yes and, and another girl she's she's in her 20s like early 20s and I was like okay what do you want to do with your life you know this is a great time to start really thinking about that what type of lifestyle do you want to have how often do you want to travel how you know how much money do you think you need to have mm. um those, all of those things like I'm constantly asking my employees those things because I don't want like I work in food and bev so I work in a fine dining restaurant so it's I don't expect people to stay there forever but I yeah. want to help them grow throughout the process I want them yes. to be thinking about what they truly want because if they don't ever think about what they want they will just be you know living going on the hamster wheel of yes I have this to do next I have I need to pay this bill I need to pay that bill and they never yeah. think about future forward. So that intentionality is so, so important. It is. I really love that you called that out. Actually, I, um, I don't know if you come across this book, but this is a great book for that. Be your future self oh. now, the science of intentional transformation. It's by Dr. Benjamin Hardy. And he 
Where I've noted out on my journey with all of this is an interesting blend of, well, it, it comes to bear in the book. It's science, soul, and then strategy is where the two meet in the middle. Because I think there's some real power in books like that, which are really around like the proven science on how we can use our brains as like heat seeking miss missiles, basically to go after goals and why it is so important to be moving toward your future with thought and intentionality because we're wired to make decisions now in this now moment that benefit us now, but don't set us up for success over the long run. So that's a huge part of it. And I love, you know, books like that in, in, in that regard to keep us really grounded in, in what we know from the science. But then there's a piece of it too, that is just like that, that soul piece and letting your heart and your intuition guide you a bit too. So I really enjoy a, a blend of those both. And I love that that comes through in your work as well. Oh yeah, I, I, I I'm always like, okay, I, I'm such a goal setter. Like, and when I took this put this position, because I was like, oh god, this is going to be so much more work. Um, but like, coaching has been one of the things that I've loved to do. I love yeah. helping people live the lives they really want to, you know, really want to, and just really mindset piecing it right, and um, you know, just asking good questions and I and yes. I love interviewing people so I, I it's invaluable. Yeah, seriously it's helped me grow so much interviewing itself has helped me grow so much because and I mean you probably have seen it too with all of the people that you all of the women that you've interviewed yes completely I oh my gosh I wholeheartedly agree it's uh one of the greatest like privileges and honors to be able to talk to people, hear their stories and hear, like pick out their little nuggets of wisdom. So yeah, I'm with you there. It's just, it, you know, cause we grow from new experiences and each new conversation that provoke, that's thought provoking will yes. really help you create a new and expand. So with that being said, I'm just like, I really want to still be able to coach more so in a leadership style for and and just overall development so I, I don't know what I'm you know doing in this part of my life but um <laughs> that's the direction it's it's going it's yeah. it's definitely not the and I I feel like I'm part of that group of women that are that 90 percent that don't plan on staying with their company for the next like five years because yeah I'm just for me when it comes to being pregnant and having to work um, the hours that I work, not really the hours that I work, because I, I could work long, a long time, but doing the work that I do and dealing with the stress that I have to deal yep. with. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and you know, like, and that's the thing, like when there's not a lot of high paying jobs that are not stressful for True. organizations. You know what I'm yes. saying? Like, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Like I want to, one of the, one of the goals I had with taking this position was increasing my level of stress, like level, my capacity for stress. Okay. Sure. Cause I, I mean, I see so many different women in higher positions that that is one of the skills that I love that they have, but yeah. it, you got to go through the mud to get there. You know, you've got to go true. through the stress to get there. And it's true. And that's like such a really really good tech skill to have because when the world it is what's your nervous system right like it's stressing the the or um training essentially the window of tolerance which is your window that you're able to stretch to on that high end of of stress and so yeah i think it's huge that's another thing that i was very unfamiliar with until beginning this journey was really understanding how my nervous system works parasympathetic versus sympathetic response and uh, understanding what I need to do to rest and recover on the side that I'm coming down so that when I do stretch to kind of like the upper end of my of my limit I'm able to recover more quickly yeah it's not something that we're ever taught or that just comes naturally in our world which is more inherently kind of stressful on all the time versus if you think about back in our sort of our more uh, early evolutionary days there was certainly stress but it would be like stress of like a of a predator or something like that and then we would come down off of it versus now 
there are stressors in our everyday environment almost all the time when we're connected all the time. We're watching 24 hour news networks, like all those things. Our nervous systems haven't completely adapted to that new way of life. So we have to learn and be conscious about how do we stretch it and then how do we reset it, which is, it's like, so it's so powerful. How do you, what are some tips that you have to reset your um, parasympathetic system? Yeah, it is for me, it is a complete disconnecting at times. And what I've come to realize is that, so burnout changes your brain. It actually does structural damage to your brain. There were some scientists that actually found this out. I think it was like 2012 or 2013. So way before the pandemic, we knew this. I had never heard about it before, but burnout actually increases the size of your amygdala, which is that warning system in your brain that goes off when there's a stressful situation is like warning, you need to take care of this and, you know, causes your, your nervous system to elevate and enter that sympathetic uh, response. And then at the same time too, in your brain, the, your ability to filter the amygdala going off, it's decreased. So it's like the red light is flashing more often and more frantically, and you're looking at it and seeing that red light as a problem almost all the time. So you actually have to let your brain heal in addition to nervous system reset to get better from burnout. So for me, because of that reason, I've had to at times spend like, a day or two completely off email, even, even during the week, like, let's say I work even a little bit on the weekend. I'll be like, I might even have to take a Tuesday off uh, completely and just let myself fully enter back into a baseline state. Now, I don't think it'll be like that forever, but sometimes we have to be a bit more, it's just like, as if we were healing an injury, right? Like if I broke my ankle, I wouldn't go running around on my ankle all day, every day. I would allow myself the time to rest, but we don't treat our mental and physical and emotional wounds from things like burnout and stress the same way. But in, in a lot of ways, we, we do need to be thoughtful like that. Thank you for that. Because I think a lot of people don't even realize how to, for me, I'm, I'm also very much like disconnect, go be out in nature. Um, yes. Or yeah. I like to watch nature videos like yeah. no no people around just just like <laughs> i'll watch about i'll watch things about bugs i'll watch things about awesome. all the animals sea life it doesn't matter it's just the nature oh i can watch landscapes i can legit just put on the screens of different landscapes that are just super pretty because yeah. that brings me calm granted you know it, it takes some time to learn these things about yourself um yes but, you know, and to help you recharge. But I mean, we don't, you can't have your phone run 24 seven, but we act like we should operate like computers, but computers still need to be shut down and restart. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and upgraded at times too, right? Like all yes. those, all those things. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm totally with you. I, and I, gosh, I just love that call out about nature so much. I had, I was, um, I've been listening to a book called Living Untethered by Michael Singer. He wrote- this book here, The Surrender Experiment, which is probably my, uh, on the other side of the pendulum from Be Your Future Self Now, this is the book on the other side. And his is all about flow and like letting life unfold and going with the flow and really kind of like surrendering to the universe. Like there's a lot of mystery yeah. to the things that happen every yeah. day and we don't necessarily understand it, right? So part of it with what he says is he talks about nature and like how nature would just nature just goes and happens and it just is right. There's no timetable, no deadlines, no nothing. So there is something super magical and restorative about just being immersed in it. And to your point, whether or not it, for me, it's like often beach or a little nature area near me, but it can be even just watching it on a screen too. But like something so restorative about remembering that that is what we come from. That is what we were built for originally. And reminding ourselves that like all the urgent things that are flying around, urgent and important all day long, really in the grand scheme of things, considering we are a blip on this, you know, floating marble in the cosmos right now, like we put so much stock in it. It's like, just get back to the root of it and connect back with that, like more natural part of ourselves that can be just so healing. Yeah. Like going on walks is like one of my daily routines. 
until I live in the Midwest, until it's like 20 degrees and less, I'm just like, no, nah. <laughs> nah. like I, <laughs> when we're in the single digits, that's when the TV comes on in our, if it's late at night and I got off really late and I had a super stressful day. I'm like, I need to watch something nature wise. Mm. So that's, yeah. that's really when it comes into like watching yeah. it, but yeah, just being outdoors. Ah, uh, it's, it's, I had somebody else on it. She called it God's living room. Like just yeah. go in there, enjoying, yeah. putting on some peaceful music. I like to take my dogs mm-hmm. out. It's just, it's phenomenal. Well, Sarah, what's one last thing you want to share with the listeners? Yeah, I think, I think the last piece of the puzzle is really in all of this. If there's anything in this conversation that has resonated or piqued some interest or sparked something in you, I would say follow that spark, follow that curiosity breadcrumb and trust that there is a part of you that's connecting with this for a very good reason. And you are not alone with more than 50% of women intending to be, you know, moving into a different uh, company or quitting, actually quitting their jobs in, you know, the next two years. And then 90% on a five-year horizon, like we are together redefining what it means to be a professional woman. So trust yourself, lean into that feeling and start to explore what might need to change to make you feel fulfilled because the old definition of success and fulfillment works for some people, but for the bulk of people, just climbing the ladder to earn more money and get fancier titles doesn't really bring true happiness. So figure out what that looks like for you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you, Olivia. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Empowered Woman Badass and Unfiltered Podcast. If you found any value in this, please consider sharing and subscribing. Now go out and be a badass.